Here we are on the 15th of February, 2011, in the City Library in Fairhope, Alabama. Speaking to you from this small studio in the public library is retired Navy Captain Richard N. Charles, that's me, fellow physical fitness devotee and a friend of our interviewee. In general, our interview this morning will follow guidelines furnished in the field kit for the Veteran History Project associated with the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. Today I am interviewing John Payuk, a World War II U.S. Navy veteran. He was born in a small rural town in Norma, New Jersey on December 2, 1921. After graduation from high school and in his late teens, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy by holding up his right hand to be sworn in in an office of the federal building located in the basement of the U.S. Post Office in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Soon thereafter, he went to boot camp in Newport, Rhode Island, and then on to training in maritime patrol aircraft maintenance and operations at East Field, Norfolk, Virginia, within VP Squadron 53. After the specialized training, he was assigned to operational flights in VP-83 and 51, monitoring large convoys departing U.S. East Coast ports en route to Europe to deliver arms and supplies to the Allied forces in Europe. His PBY amphibious aircraft patrol planes operated out of three primary airfields in San Juan, Puerto Rico, British West Indies, and Trinidad. John, or as his friends call him, Jack, graduated from boot camp, a seaman apprentice, shipped over twice and extended his naval service from 1942 to 1963, when he retired as a first class petty officer with 21 years of service to his credit. I will let Jack tell you about his early life in New Jersey, his siblings and other family members, and his early days in training with the Maritime Patrol Aircraft Squadrons. He will then tell you about his wartime experiences and the ensuing actions within the theaters that he operated. <clears throat> so with that brief introduction, Jack, take her away. Thank you, T, you're my immediate supervisor. <laughs> uh, I am Jack Joseph Bayuk, and uh, I, one of the greatest generations of this country has ever known. And from there, uh, I'll start my history uh, from the time that we got inducted into the service, uh, as you well have been aware, that we are at war. Uh, December 7th was a remarkable thing in my life that I'll never forget. Uh, getting back to uh, my first assignment was an apprentice seaman that I uh, went to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and at the time uh, it was an enormous, uh, personnel-wise, over a thousand people, which they reduced it later on. Uh, we were getting together. We didn't have any airplanes at the time. We was waiting for VP-34 to come back from uh, their, their duty at the Med Mediterranean, uh, convoy duty and, and anti-submarine patrol. And we were to pick up their planes and continue on our way. The, uh, that took place uh, somewhere in 42. I don't know exactly the dates, uh, escapes me, but and therefore, we went to uh, the first place we operated was from Key West, Florida. And a uh, very short period of time, we moved into uh, Trinidad. Trinidad, we then discovered that we was to pick up uh, almost weekly a convoy of ships that was coming from the East Coast all the way through down into going to Europe. Uh, uh, numbers of planes, about 30 in numbers. Uh, we uh, 
we took uh, that plane uh, of our plane, the PBY. That's my home. Uh, this airplane at the time was doing marvelous things. Uh, it was a consolidated airplane with the twin engine uh, Pratt & Whitney and Hamilton Standard prop, 104 wingspan and 86 uh, fuselage. Uh, we usually had six plane uh, members of the, the pilot and navigators and radio men and mechanics. And we flew 12 to 14 hour patrols. Now getting to where we was in Trinidad, uh, we would pick up the convoy and escort it uh, all the way down as far as our gas consumption would go. And uh, usually we lose at nighttime, uh, we'd lose at least one or two planes, uh, not planes, ships by the submarines. They were operating in a wolf pack and uh, wolf packs six and eight uh, subs at a time and uh, they would do hectic duties to a convoy they would uh, they picked on it they would come right up out of the middle and uh, and get it what they wanted and bang away and, and, and blow them up and we couldn't do much thing but chase after them uh, some we caught and some we didn't mostly we didn't uh, but that was that thing is but that was the history of going from there to Trinidad, down to British West Indies and so forth. And uh, we operated about a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, Admiral Hoover got his orders to go to the Pacific. Uh, in the meantime, you know, the everyday livelihood of a, of a man that's operating in with a crew, uh, your life was with one another. We got very, very close to one another, and uh, we knew all our problems of one, one or another's uh, business and so forth. Uh, that's how we operated. That's how we, we were very, very, very close to one another. So we knew each other's job. Uh, I don't say that uh, I could have flown the airplane, but I'd made a good attempt if I had to and everybody else knew everybody else's job, and that's why we, we've done such a marvelous job with that airplane. Uh, <clears throat> Admiral Hoover again got his orders to the West Coast. Uh, we operated on the East Coast with uh, fairly, uh, no, no, uh, we didn't really know that there was a bad war on. We weren't shot at, uh, per se. Uh, the submarines, uh, we was after them, and we know that we were going to kill them. And uh, to a young boy to come out of the farm and to say to yourself, I have to kill, is something that we had to uh, deal with. Uh, we all dealt with that. I think everybody that was in the military had to deal with that idea. Uh, but there, there again, it was one of the things that uh, uh, wartime was hell. Ellen Roosevelt said that. Uh, <clears throat> but here we are, and Admiral says, uh, I want VP-81 and VP-53 of the two PBY squadrons to come with me out to the Pacific. Well, we all got issued orders. I, at the time, was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in the gunnery school. I'm glad I did. Uh, I knew... Uh, how to shoot a gun. Well, all I ever did was farmer equipment. I didn't know anything to do with anything with a gun in my hand. So they taught me, taught me well. Therefore, we went from uh, San Diego, we got migrated out there and turned our planes, old planes in. Uh, they were refurbished for another squadron that we uh, picked up brand new PBY 5As. This is what a PBY 5A looks like. It has wheels, two side mounts, and a nose wheel. You can land on water or land. It's very, you can carry two 500 pounders or torpedoes on either side. Uh, and, uh, 
these these pilots are very experienced. I flew with uh, Commander Moore, the senior pilot of uh, these type airplanes with hours in the air. Uh, there was quite an honor to be flying with him. Very, very strict man, but he, he knew what he was doing. Uh, Jack, the 500 pounders were standard bombs and not uh, standard standard bombs, yeah. Not uh, ash cans, as they called them. Yeah, no, that was the standard 500 pounder. Uh, so as consolidated uh, got our planes ready, we needed 12 planes, and uh, I was the first three planes that got, and because I was flying with the executive officer, uh, Commander Quillen, and uh, is uh, our name that we gave each other. He was it was Face Quillen, <laughs> and he was quite a character, uh, a gentleman to no less that knew what he was doing. He brought me there and brought me home many a time. I was thankful for his experience. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we took a uh, flight from San Diego to uh, Kaneohe, Oahu, or Alamu, not Oahu. And uh, it was a, some 18 hour flight. Now what we had to do, we had to take the side bounce off and put 165 gallon tanks so we'd have extra fuel that uh, we couldn't carry enough fuel so it was 165 on either side and then we had a transfer pump to bring it up into the main tank and we uh, we uh, we had to uh, do that and uh, once we used the uh, gas out of the wheel wells and got it up there that was your point of no return. After that, you were committed to go across the borders. And uh, we didn't have any trouble, although we did lose one plane, and I don't know whether it happened to it, and it never did determine, but we lost one of the planes going across. So that left us with 11 airplanes and 12 crews. So everybody had to buddy up, and they could fly our plane until we could get another plane out. Uh, <clears throat> we got to Kaneohe, and uh, operations uh, continued on that uh, we didn't stay there very long, uh, less than two weeks. And uh, we were ordered to a little island of Funafuti. Now these names are all Japanese held islands at one time. The, uh, the island uh, had a good runway and uh, we got most of the squadron down there and we started operating and that's when we weren't convoys anymore. We were going out hunting for the anti-submarine and uh, along with that, we, uh, there was uh, four or five other islands around Japanese held that uh, still had people on them that we would uh, run Newsom raids. Every 30 minutes we'd drop a bomb and between the, the F-6s and the F-4Us and the B-25s and the B-26s and the PBYs, uh, we kept them awake uh, quite a bit. And uh, we would get after them uh, constantly, day and night. And our patrols was, again, eight hours was, was a miracle to get, but we did mostly 12 and 14 hour patrols. We went through from the island of Fulurifuli to uh, Abamama. Now, Abamama was designed for the B-29 that was to go all the way into Japan to take Japan uh, to bomb them. Uh, but they were going so fast that they even bypassed that Abamama and went into truck and so forth. And all this taking place now I'm giving you a fast resume of uh, when we were there at least in a year and a half of every day uh, between uh, all the islands, just going from one island to the other. We was uh, stationed at uh, Funafuti. And uh, now getting back to what happened to my airplane, we weren't there two weeks when they bombed us. The Jap, I, used, I think they were using Mavis as they were called 
it was a four engine bomber and uh, my plane got a 500 pounder dropped along the port side and uh, that was the time that my pilot, Mr. Quillen, says uh, we lost our airplane. And they towed it down at the end of the runway and left it. Well, that was a brand new airplane. The bureau number was 33984, just like I knew my own name. I knew that plane. Uh, I said to myself, no, I'm not going to let them do me in. I'm going to go down and fix that airplane. And. Uh, Commander Quillen says, if you fix the airplane, I'll see that you make first class. I was E-5 at the time. And uh, I pursued it. Now, I had to make my regular flights with my regular crew, but at nighttime and oh, whatever, we put that plane back together. I had to put a new port engine, two side mounts, uh, all the port wheel, all the things, all the control surfaces of the airplane. Uh, the reason I had such a love, I know what this airplane was all about, because I built it just about after they the bombed us, and I wasn't going to let them go. Now, it took me over two months to put that plane back together again, bumming the, the parts and, and whatever that we could get from Pearl to come down on ships to bring it to it. And uh, we got it all together. As it well, and I don't blame any one of them, but nobody wanted to test hop it. Uh, one of the enlisted pilots, R.C. Randall, uh, was a first class, very, very astute boy that went through Pensacola Flight School. And he, uh, he says uh, to me, Jack, he says, are you going with the plane? I says, it's my plane and I'll fly it. So Benny Field was my radar man. These names come very easily because they're so vivid in my mind. I know these people like the back of my hand because we lived together. We, we were going to live together and we might have died together, but so there's a good Lord to have it. It didn't happen. Nevertheless, Benny Field, myself, and R.C. Randall, when I sat in the second seat and we come down the runway, wide open, throttles wide open, and he pulled that stick back over there and we went shoop open the air. And we'd done everything that we could possibly do to pull that airplane apart, but it didn't happen. It fell, it, it was all together and stayed together. And I flew that plane till the time of our tour was up and brought it back to Kaneohe. And I blew the nose wheel on it on the last landing. That was the, 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 the my story of, of the uh, history. But getting back to uh, the islands of the one we went from Funafuti to Avamama, Majuro, and uh, that was the three major uh, islands that we operated from. Believe me, there was days that I didn't think that we was going to ever see my home again. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the operation that we went through, uh, we didn't lose any planes, other than one plane that was uh, got too close to one of the islands, and some somebody was uh, with a rifle, I guess, uh, fired at the plane and it hit the the, the windshield piece of it blew into his eye and put his eye out. That was one of the damages we had. And that was probably the only damage we ever had. Uh, we lost one other plane. I forgot that one. Uh, one of my greater shipmates. <coughs> he, uh, he got too close to uh, an island uh, they they took a lot of chances, you know, getting down real close, and uh, somebody uh, let one go, and then we lost that plane. And uh, the uh, flight engineer 
he got orientated wrong and he and he swam towards the island instead of away. Uh, they blew a, uh, had a smoke screen in front of it there that they could get away and get pick him up, and uh, he he went the wrong way. Later on, we learned that they. Uh, It's hard things to remember. <coughs> they cut his tongue out, and they put him in one of them little wooden carts, and they carted him up and down all the little islands around there to show what they were winning the war. That was one of their things that they did to our people, uh, and I'm sure that uh, he was welcoming to be dead. Uh, he finally did got killed. I'm sure. We never know, but we knew that, that we had pictures from the uh, people that was uh, honoring the, uh, the, the accidents and what have you. Took it uh, from there that uh, he didn't. He, he disappeared out of it and things. So we don't know really what happened to him. But I, they did know that he cut his tongue out. He couldn't talk, and uh, they were they were vicious people. Uh, it's hard for me to shake of their hand today, but we, we do that. They're going back into the everyday missions that we was after. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot more going on. It was just uh, like I, I left out when I was on the East Coast one time, uh, talk about gas and such and how important it was to be working with the navigator and how much gas you had and where you were gone. We got off of Venezuela one time and ran out of gas. Uh, we had to land and wait for the uh, Trinidad came with a ship with gas for us. And that was one of the smaller things that happened to us. Uh, and I, I was just scared, so I immediately broke out uh, the 50 caliber gun on the on the port side over here. We had the 50 caliber mounted in there, and uh, this guy and they came up with this long boat there, but about half a dozen people rowing it, and they told us they was going to give us so many hours to get that get get there out of there, or they was going to turn us. So that was a, a mistake that they it didn't happen. We got the gas and we were gone before anything. Uh, that was uh, what happened to on, on the East Coast. Uh, the West Coast, the worst that was happening to me was, uh, I was unfortunate to catch the dinghy fever. Believe me, if you ever, ever get the dinghy fever, you ho hope that you don't even move your eyes. But I laid in a tent out there uh, for almost two weeks with that sickness there until they got us got me cured up, uh, but that was one of the f things that could happen to you out in the Pacific uh, during the wartime. I don't know of any other major thing that happened because, uh, you know, I, you, you lived every day, most of the time I slept on the beach, and uh, they told us not to do that because uh, it had been known that them Japs would come in the, from one of the smaller islands They'd slit your throat in a minute, uh, but it never happened. So here I am. <laughs> uh, I don't know what else that I could uh, bring to the attention of anything, but uh, again, the greatest, greatest generations of people, and I was only one that went through the World War II, from uh, as was mentioned from 1942 to 1963, and I retired and uh, went into various things of, of civilian life. And uh, today I live a very normal life, uh, unfortunately by myself, but uh, that's another story that we'll have to happen. Uh, there's uh, things that happen to the shipmates that you get lost, you don't never, never see them again. And uh, it's one thing about the Navy, and I'm sure that the other militaries have the closeness of going called the greatest thing you can be called is a shipmate. You might want to discuss too, Jack, that <clears throat> you left the PBYs in the latter later stages of your career. Uh, 
Uh, to yeah, go to P2V, P2V, yeah. Neptune. I left it to that. I, I operated that on the Korean War, and I came one back. That's a big another thing I forgot about. Uh, I took the PVY, uh, and, and uh, it was out, out, and uh, we went into the P2V. That's a uh, Peter Two Victor uh, Lockheed made that airplane. It had 2,800 engines. Hamilton standard props, some was uh, with Curtis electric props. Uh, this had a bomb bay door, which you could put a load of bombs in there. Uh, and I don't recall the uh, how much bombs we carried in that thing, but uh, it was somewhere in, I'd say, seven or eight 500 pounders we could carry with that P2V. Uh, and we went out and with that back to the Pacific again, and uh, we patrolled an anti-submarine again there, and we stayed out there for another year or so uh, with the P2Vs. And then I came back, and the war got over after that situation, and uh, I'm making, making these things go fast, because uh, it's, it's just a lot of, uh, it's not waste of time, but there's time that we spent uh, with the planes operating uh, and then I got into the uh, constellation the Willie Willie Victors and I was up in Newfoundland with them uh, anti submarine patrol with them it was a much four that was a four engine plane we know that we have today still operating with them uh, and uh, one of the great things about them it had a good kitchen in there and you could make <laughs> some meals and <laughs> <laughs> well, <And laughs> the Super Connie also had that huge radar disc. The, the dome up on the top over right. there, that, that spun around over there, and you could pick up from the level of the water to 35,000 feet, that nothing was supposed to be able to generate through that. Uh, I don't know if that was a, a real actual thing that happened, but uh, that's what they claimed. Uh, we've done a lot of work with that airplane. And uh, I didn't fly as much with that plane as I did with the other two, but I, I did my share. Uh, somewhere along the line, I lost my flight log. And that was something that I, I, uh, I think that uh, somebody picked it up because I did something that wasn't supposed to be done. I wrote in the back empty pages there some of the things that happened to me, and I, that's a no-no. And they didn't want, uh, for whatever reason, somebody put that out that you were not supposed to write in there. And I did. And I think somebody got it and probably destroyed it. I don't know. But I don't have it anymore. It's a little brown book, book that keep every flight that you took with the United States Navy is always documented and then signed every month by the operations officers. Uh, them two planes there, so there was three planes of the PBY, the P2V, and the Constellations that I operated. And uh, I had to go to uh, Burbank, California, to the flight engineer school out there to learn to be a flight engineer. Now, that was a unique plane because I handled the throttles on that airplane. The pilot would say, uh, power, and that meant for me to give the power and uh, we got it back into whatever we would reduce the speed and climbing out and so forth and, and cruising speeds and so forth we all had that worked out and uh, again as always in an airplane gasoline was one of the biggest factors that you ever want to look you needed to know how much you got how much gas you have how much you burned on each engine and how long you can stay in the air you, and then you work with the navigator, and the navigator lets you know where you were most of the time. That's your life of a flight engineer in the United States Navy. Did you ever run out of gas except for that one on that, the East that Coast? One, we, uh, I warned the pilots constantly uh, in that particular time. I didn't want to <coughs> get into that, but we will. Uh, Lieutenant Moore. Lieutenant Commander Moore at the time, and Lieutenant Jones was the two pilots. And it was a night patrol, and uh, we were going with a convoy. 
and we uh, we took the convoy from one place to another, and we'd go off and come back and count them. They lost a couple of ships, and uh, uh, I kept saying to them, I says, now you can't be, and every time that you climb, you have to use full powers of the gas consumption. You have to take your levers and put them up there so your gas consumption would be more so you could use the engine and have plenty of gas. Well, they'd done that too many times, and you can't do that because that was burning up a lot of my gas. And I kept warning them, and they uh, not hear that they was busy doing other things, and we all lost track. And then when uh, he says, "Navigator, give me a course back to the base," and I spoke up and I said, "You don't have gas to go home." <laughs> so that was not not likely to be the, the thing that you wanted to hear, but we didn't have the gas to go home, so we had to land on the water and wait for, we had to wire to Trinidad to bring us some gas. And we were the black sheep of the family when that happened. <laughs> but uh, everybody would go around and give me the sign. You ran out of gas, didn't you? <laughs> That's what happens. You don't ever want to do anything in the military that they can laugh at you because they're going to they're going to pick on you to no end. So you better have some thick skin. Uh, so the guys was, on the base said, "Listen to Jack when yeah, you go up." <laughs> yeah, and when you you do all these things, that's what happens to you. But it was something that uh, I I never would uh, forget. All these things that happened to me, I forgot some of the things I I should be saying, but I I, I forget them. And uh, some of the bad things, uh, as you well know, my actions tell me, the actions, losing your shipmate, is not fun. And, uh, but that's, uh, now that I've been retired for so many years, uh, the good Lord's let me live till 89 years last December. Uh, I hope to go as far as I can go. I go to the YMCA three times a week and, uh, and uh, I work out and uh, live a comfortable life. I appreciate my attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice presentation, Jack. Well, it was all up here, uh, mingled up. I could have went along and who want to hear of everyday living, you know, it's, 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 just, it's, you know, we got up and went to bed just like anybody else. We flew and flew and flew and flew, and uh, I'm sure that I've killed some people, and there wasn't anything nice to be remembered about. Mm. Uh, they wanted to kill me, but they didn't. Mm. That's fortunate. Uh, that's unfortunate to, to them. Well, but that's, that's wartime, and wartime is like Eleanor Roosevelt said, it's hell.